Thermocatalytic cracking. A lot of you guys have heard of Charles Nelson Pogue, who in 1936, with his fifth patented design, took a 1935 Ford V8 over 176 miles per U.S. gallon, about 206 miles per the Imperial gallon. He had this double helical spiraling. Do I have it in here? Picture of it? Look in the index, save time. Covey the pan, nope, it's in the new version. Um, if you vaporize gasoline, you don't get a whole heck of a lot more energy from just vaporizing the gasoline. There have been mm, probably 50 or more people who in our modern era have decided they were gonna replicate this patented design of Mr. Pogue, and they're getting anywhere from 20 to 50% increases on vehicles, and that's about it. They're not coming anywhere near the 200 miles per gallon old Charlie got. The reason is, is because the gasoline back in 1936 was fractionalized. That means that what was in gasoline molecularly was the way it was in nature in the crude oil. So they just would put a low temperature on there and the stuff that would vaporize off had that low vapor point that we had discussed before the lunch. And then they would add a little bit more heat and then they would you know, vaporize that next component off and then add more heat and vaporize that next and they could keep separating it. And then the gasoline was just combinations of these natural molecules as found in the crude oil, a fractionalization process. In the mid 1930s, the oil companies introduced thermal catalytic cracking. Up until the mid 30s, a barrel of crude would yield approximately 23% gasoline. And <clears throat> believe it or not, in the 1800s, they wanted the kerosene for kerosene lanterns. They wanted the you know, heavy stuff for uh, wagon wheel grease and the wax, the paraffin for candles. The gasoline was a throwaway. They would pump the crude out and then dump the gas back down the hole again. It was worthless to them. And then the internal combustion engine came along. Wow, all of a sudden they have the market for this crap. Well, the internal combustion engine started getting more and more widely used. And now all of a sudden they actually needed more gasoline than they were getting out of a barrel of crude. They couldn't sell candles fast enough. So they came up with a thermal catalytic cracking process. And they later in the uh, late 40s took the process in reverse so it could take the lighter stuff. Thermal catalytic, crack, thermal catalytic cracking, TCC for short, would take the heavy stuff and break it into smaller elements that could be used as gasoline. Then the other process, which name eludes me at the moment, took the lighter stuff and combined it into heavier stuff that could be used as gasoline. And right now we're getting approximately 43 to 49% gasoline out of a barrel of crude, depending on where it's from. So, <clears throat> thermal catalytic cracking. Let's break it down. Thermal requires heat, right? <laughs> catalytic means that we're using <clears throat> some sort of a catalyst. Does everybody remember what Dennis told us about catalysts this morning? They change the physiology of the, but they don't get changed. They contribute to some kind of a chemical reaction without being consumed in that reaction, right? Cracking. We're going to break stuff. <clears throat> Thermal catalytic cracking. Three words, each contributing to the overall meaning of the phrase. Now, let's take a look at a thermal catalytic cracking process. Getting back to that horrid, horrid chemistry again. Let's take the all familiar um, octane molecule. We got eight carbons. I slap 18 little hydrogens on them. Okay, under heat and pressure, we can go in 
<clears throat> and let's just chew off right there. What that'll give us is right now then let's uh eh, we'll break it here and then we'll break it there so let's draw all of that out so we got three now let's add another two and uh another two and then a one and we had the hydrogens. We're only going to use the hydrogens that we have here. So that means we're going to have those empty arms wanting to grab stuff. Very good. <clears throat> Again, these are charged particles. These are ions. We have these magnetic arms here wanting to grab onto something. So if we plug additional hydrogens in here. Ah, there's a propane. There's an ethane. There's another ethane. There's a natural gas. These will all stay in a vaporous state at very, very low temperatures, even high pressure low temperatures. They'll burn real quick. So we took the energy, thermal energy from the engine, in the presence of some kind of a catalyst. We broke stuff. And then, for all intents and purposes, we stabilized it again. Now, all this extra hydrogen I had to plug in, we're going to add from our fuel cell. Okay? And the hydrogen isn't even stable, diatomic. I mean, it's just free floating atoms. It's the monatomic water fuel hydrogen. And it'll readily plug into that. So, as we're drawing up on our compression stroke, we're building pressure. Pressure helps this TCC process, by the way makes it happen easier. And we got the extreme temperatures of the combustion chamber because we just kicked out a bunch of, you know, several hundred degree exhaust gases. And now we're also going to take, and we're going to take this much room, condense it into this much space. We're going to actually concentrate the thermal energy. The temperature is going to go up. So we definitely have thermal in our compression stroke. We have the iron cylinder walls. Iron's a poor catalyst, but it is one nonetheless. We have, believe it or not, the center and the outer electrodes of the spark plugs, the cylinder head, the valves, the piston top, and yes, the piston rings themselves because the air fuel charge is going to come and spiral around in the engine, and the cool cylinder walls will actually condense a lot of those undecanes, dodecanes, decanes. Just like, you know, in the morning you get up and your windshield is covered with dew, you know, in the spring and the fall. So as that piston comes up, those rings are just going to like a windshield wiper. It's going to scrape all that fuel. So <clears throat> if we can get maybe two or three percent of these to break ahead of time, we've actually increased the fuel economy <coughs> about fourfold. For every one percent of this process I drew out, we can get of the fuel, we've increased the fuel economy 4% for that molecule, fourfold for that molecule. So if we can get 2 or 3% of the octanes to crack, we've got uh, 8 or 12% increase in fuel economy. A molecule takes up a given amount of space. Whether it's a natural gas molecule, a dodecane molecule, a paraffin wax molecule, a lead or gold molecule. In the ether, a molecule takes up a certain amount of space. Do you understand that before I give you the punchline? Okay. So if we take one gallon of octane and we crack all of the molecules into fours, and then recondense it back into a liquid again, adding the necessary hydrogen to stabilize. And then recondense the resultant back into a liquid again. Start out with one gallon of octane. We will wind up with darn near four gallons of this processed fuel. 
crack 100% of the octane into four various sized molecules, recondense it back into a liquid, that one gallon of liquid turns into four gallons of liquid. Because the molecule, this molecule takes up the same amount of space in that one gallon container as this octane molecule did previously. Because the molecule takes up the same amount of space. Now we have four times the number of <coughs> molecules we started out with. We started out with one molecule, now we have four. So if we start out with one gallon of octane, we break it up randomly like this into four separate molecules, recondense it into a liquid, we now have four gallons of this concoction. That's a tough one to understand. That's one that when you say it to a scientist, he goes, well, yeah. But, you know, I never thought about it as applicable to gasoline in an engine. If we could take the dodecanes, think about this, guys. If we could take the dodecanes, or better yet, let's use a C18, C16, C18 diesel fuel, okay? And we take that diesel fuel and we convert it into natural gas. We start out with a gallon of diesel fuel. We wind up with like 16 gallons of natural gas. We're compressed and cooled to a liquid state. Wow. Of course, we had a lot of hydrogen to, to, to make that happen, but nevertheless. So, we, 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 <clears throat> it's like we take one gallon of diesel fuel and probably 15 gallons of water. We wind up with 16 gallons of natural gas. Wow. P-I-C-C is going to be doing this. The fuel that the engine sees, if we put diesel fuel in the tank of our PICC vehicle, put diesel fuel in the liquid holding tank, the engine never sees a drop of diesel. What the engine sees is propane, ethane, natural gas, perhaps butane, which is a four carbon, pentane, which is a five carbon, so we can literally start out with a gallon of diesel and wind up with at least five or six gallons of this stuff, if not more. Are you following that? Yeah, yes. Does it make sense? Does anybody disagree? Am I blowing smoke, lying to you through my teeth? You need a holding tank for all that. <clears throat> we only do it on demand. on demand. We don't have to put a gallon in and then convert it all and say, now what do I do with it? We just put a teaspoon in and then run the engine for five minutes. Put another teaspoon in. But let's backtrack. Yes, sir? You're not saying just four times the energy. You're saying four times the volume. Four times the volume. Not just four times the energy. Four times the volume. Because, again, this molecule, this eight-carbon octane molecule, and this molecule, a one-carbon natural gas molecule, take up the same space in the ether. So, if we were to freeze the natural gas into a solid form, no, I don't know anybody who can do that. Cryogenics aren't that advanced. But if we could, we'd get, you know, like a, a block so big. If we freeze this, we'll get a block about the same size. Turn it into a liquid. One gallon. One gallon. Same number of molecules in that gallon. Yes, sir. Do you have to add anything or is it, it just... You have to add hydrogen. Yeah. Because remember, when we crack this, we're going to be short uh, hydrogen here, 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 yeah. here, and here. Now, that is not stable. We aren't going to make a gallon of that stuff. It, it, it won't happen. We're going to get a bunch of thermal reactions going in all kind of different ways and we're going to get radicals and uh, chances are we'll wind up with... Uh, paraffin wax by the time everything stabilizes back together plus a little bit of natural gas. It won't work the way we want it to, that's for sure. Now the cracking and the combining of hydrogen all, is all going to take place within the PICC at the, pretty much at the same moment. Mm -hmm. crack. Mm -hmm. so it's a, that's why it's a continuous right. loop. We're pumping the fuel in, we're running it through the reactor with additional hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And again, no absolute, so diesel, diesel molecules in, we'll get a bunch of this stuff, plus we'll get some diesel molecules out. 
And if we don't get enough hydrogen in there, we'll get diesel molecules in and occasional paraffin wax molecule coming out along with lighter stuff. So that's why it's looped again and 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 again. Now the whole system has to be able to handle all those different types of uh, waxes or oils somehow. <laughs> there's, there's no waxes. I'm using that for illustration, but there's not going to be waxes coming out. There will be oils. And that's what the condenser is for, is to trap those oils, trap the heavy liquids, the stuff that did not get reformed, and recycle it back around through the liquid side. Mm -hmm. That which is able to stay a vapor, at least an aerosol, will get recycled back around again also, mm -hmm. so it keeps getting broken down again and again and again. Each time, <laughs> each pass, additional hydrogen is pumped into the system. I just don't want the system to clog up with the heavier materials. Yes, sir. Then the oxygen doesn't get used at that point. <clears throat> We're not pumping high oxygen in there. Okay, only the, the corn hydrogen. cooker okay. does what it does in the lack, in the absence of oxygen. There's no oxygen in that corn cooker. <clears throat> They're not putting atmosphere in there. Because if they did put atmosphere in there, instead of getting usable vapors, they get carbon dioxide and ash. So the corn cooker is shooting those pellets through into that plasma field with no oxygen. Therefore, it vaporizes into fuel. The same with the PICC. That, the, the, the very fact that we're recycling the reformed fuel back around a second time, the primary reason is so that there's no atmospheric oxygen getting in there. The hydrogen generator is going to separate the oxygen away. So, excuse me, only the hydrogen gets pumped in. Because if we pump oxygen into that reactor, we're going to get carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, vegetable oils. Anybody know the difference, molecularly speaking, between a diesel molecule and a vegetable oil molecule? One oxygen atom. You take diesel fuel and you add one oxygen atom to it, and you got cooking oil. So since this is a class on the HAFC, this process is nice to know here because, although we're not going to be literally measuring gallons of fuel, we're going to be adding hydrogen in a monatomic state to the engine. And on the compression stroke, we're going to have a catalytic material, be it the aluminum, be it you know, the, the, the valves, the piston rings. We're going to have a catalyst. We're going to have temperature. We're going to be doing this process before the spark plug ever goes off. So if this were a dodecane molecule, instead of taking 33 milliseconds to burn, we can wind up with quite a few smaller molecules that take a millisecond or less to burn. We just improve the efficiency of the engine. Now I've got two questions. This gentleman was first. Uh, where does the hydrogen come from? Our fuel cell. Yes, and I'm going to get to the oxygen in just a moment. I'm taking the monatomic hydrogen and the monatomic oxygen that's produced by the fuel cell, and I'm introducing to you as a class what they do for the engine, but one at a time, so as I don't confuse you. So this is what the hydrogen does for our process. And then and when everybody understands this, I'm going to erase the board, and then I'm going to go into what the monatomic oxygen does for our process. And a question back here. Well, that, that was part of the, most of the question, but so for the PICC, then you'll have to be able to separate that, ga that mm -hmm. gas to keep mm -hmm. the oxygen gas out of the, out of the plasma. Yes, in the PICC, the oxygen and the hydrogen gases will be separated. Yeah. Only the hydrogen will be put into the reaction chamber. The oxygen will probably be dumped to the air cleaner. But we're using the PICC to help us better understand the potential of the HAFC at this moment. So this is actually a class on the HAFC that by understanding the HAFC, understanding the PIC, see how they tie together, when it's time to come back for the refresher course and learn how to install a PICC, A, you've already got this technical mumbo jumbo, you've installed a few HAFCs, you learned to tune them, so the PICC is just a shoe in The learning curve, instead of being like this, is now like this. Because there's a lot of guys out with the HAFCs fighting to try to grasp and the, the tuning and, and all of that. So you get past the HAFC, PICC is just, yeah, the second one you're a master. So any more questions on the hydrogen side? The hydrogen burned by itself in the cylinder is correct though, right? Alone. Well, you're saying some of the hydrogen will burn by itself? 
That's a generic term. I'm trying to show you chemically what does it mean to burn hydrogen. Exactly what, all, I mean, when you say burn hydrogen, what the heck are you talking about? Well, the hydrogen the fuel cell is making is, is restabilizing those molecules after the mm -hmm. fact. This is an intermediary step because after this, then these molecules are going to go through that OH radical chewing them up process, right? The so pressure. now we're going to throw in some monatomic oxygen molecules. So we got a monatomic oxygen molecule that goes and it's going to snatch away that hydrogen from that carbon. Now we have our OH radical. It'll go and it'll snatch away this. Hydrogen from that um, ethane molecule. Now we have a stable H2O water molecule. Isn't that one of the byproducts of normal healthy combustion? So now, 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 now let's throw in another oxygen molecule, or I'm sorry, oxygen atom, monatomic oxygen atom. And we're going to let it steal away this, and it's going to steal away this. See how that OH radical process just starts nibbling away at these? We get another one in here. Now we have another water molecule. Now eventually we get enough of these things going to where we can start pulling away carbons. There's carbon monoxide as soon as we break it here. Carbon monoxide looks like this. There's carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide is just another oxygen atom coming along and hooking onto the other side of that carbon, stabilizing it. CO2, one carbon, two oxygens. <laughs> so the whole process is you're starting out with something like this, plus oxygen gas, and the oxygens go in there, create those OH radicals, and first start nibbling away at the hydrogens, and then go in and start nibbling away at the carbons. You start OH and CO, and then you convert it even further into CO2 and H2O. Well, those are the two byproducts of combustion. Do all that in thermal energy. So there's three. Heat. And what are we doing with our fuel cell? <laughs> we are feeding monatomic high, uh, oxygen and monatomic hydrogen into this process. You guys have a working understanding of the chemistry here. As instructors, you may choose to train this stuff, teach this stuff, learn it well enough to do, and you can skip over it. But I need you to at least have been exposed to this, to where you understand what's going on. Excuse me, I just have one question. I'm sorry if you could go back and explain the breaking process when we, can, when, when we have to continue, start to break those down. That's going to happen in, in a lousy engine design. It's going to happen in a good engine design. The better it happens, the more efficient the engine. I'm talking about before we get, before these we, blue lines here. Yeah, when we when we break that down. <laughs> okay. Um, it just happens in the process of heat. You have these bonds that get weak. They get fragile. The heat, the pressure. And if this molecule were to bounce off of a catalyst, it'll shatter it like crystal. Okay. You'll get a couple of the atoms that'll stick together into an mm -hmm. ionized molecule, but the whole big molecule will shatter into a couple of smaller chunks when it hits the catalyst, when all the conditions are right. Now, if you take a big block Chrysler engine, open chamber head, those guys who have run these things know they like to see 38, 40 degrees of timing advance. It takes forever to get the thing lit because there's no activity going on in the cylinder. It's dead in there. And then you take a, you know, a 350 Chevy engine that's got, you know, close tolerance squish pad. And I mean, some of these race engines are run 24 degrees before top dead center. That's it. That's all that engine needs because there's activity going on inside the cylinder. The more activity, the quicker this whole process happens. If you got a dead, still open field with no wind, throw a match in there, it's going to take a couple of days to burn that stupid thing. But if you get nice, you know, wind going 
and you throw a match in there, phew, it might take an hour. And, and so this process has to happen. If we do it on an old big block Chrysler, we might be able to take the timing from 38 degrees back to 32. We take a nice, efficient, small block Chevy, we take it from 24 maybe back to 16 or 18. There's guys out there that are literally running five degrees advance on Hondas, these 16 valve Hondas. I mean, we're talking super high output engines, high compression. My all time hero, I mean, the guy I looked up to that I would love to just sweep his floors for six months and just kind of pay attention to what he's doing, his name is Larry Widmer. He has a shop down in Houston, Texas called Endyne, E N D Y N, Energy Dynamics. Now, this guy is running these Honda engines 23 to 1 compression. Wow. 100 octane fuel. I mean, 100 octane fuel, 23 to 1 compression. Little 1 1.6 liter engines pushing almost 600 horsepower. <laughs> He's got turbo charged Honda engines. 30 pounds of boost, 13 to 1 compression. 30 pounds of boost, 13 to 1 compression on 93 octane pump gas. So how's that possible? Why Combustion that efficiency. How he does that? Man? I don't have the time. <laughs> www.theoldone.com T H E O L D O N E www.theoldone.com I know a little bit more about what he's doing than what's on that website because I've worked with him before and I'm working with him now. But he's got a lot on there. <clears throat> but anyhow, I got sidetracked. Yes, sir. You're Radical twos for stealing, <coughs> washing and stealing the hydrogen from these. So now your ethanol is unstable. Eth yeah, yeah. Gonna well, that's okay because if you take water and you put it in a freezer, it's going to want to solidify into ice. It's going to want to phase change down into ice. You take that same water and put it in the oven and it's going to want to phase change to a vapor. This is not exactly a phase change. This is a chemical reaction. But again, if you just break these up in a normal, what we would call stable environment, these unstable ions will want to recombine. But in a combustion process, it's going the other way. So if we were just going to break these up, like in a PICC, we come out the tail end of the PICC and we go into a storage tank, a holding tank, they're not going to want to stay like that. They're going to want to start recombining again. But if we take and we get them this far and then we throw them into a combustion chamber with oxygen, then they're going to keep going, keep going and break down into the carbon dioxide water vapor. So they're, going to, they're going to break down further. They're going to keep going, keep going, keep going, right. They're going to get smaller and smaller. Because they're being consumed <laughs> in the combustion process. They're, the, the, the environment is different. You know, in a combustion chamber with the, with the flame front and all that, they're going to keep deteriorating with this OH radical attacking them. Okay. But if you were to take them out of a PICC, put them in a storage tank, they're going to recombine back into octanes, paraffin waxes, or whatever. So it's, it's the difference between taking water, throwing it in the, in the freezer, or taking <coughs> water and throwing it in the oven. So, so the radical is, is actually helping it burn? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And see, <clears throat> under the pressure and temperature in a combustion cylinder on the compression stroke, some of this process actually starts. We start getting our free radicals. We start getting, you know, little bits and pieces here that are starting to miss arms and legs and toes before we actually put them in there and, and do the process turning them into hamburger. When the spark plug goes off, then it's a, an accelerated all out, let's get her done. But a lot of this will actually start happening on the compression stroke. I mean, we could dovetail off into detonation and all that stuff, which, yeah, I mean, detonation, there is no spark. It's not exactly exposed to the flame front, but this process has already started, and then it just goes ballistic. Right. And it literally explodes. Instead of a nice controlled burn, it, it literally explodes. So I saw another hand waving. Just waving hi. Okay, hi. No, no, no more questions? All right. I know this is deep stuff. I've been out of school 
Yeah, for 23 years now. <laughs> I see some of you guys have a few more grades than me, so I'm guessing you're older than me. I could be wrong, and it's probably been longer since you were in school. So this is headache material, I know. Ask your son or your grandson to explain it to you. Watch the, watch the tapes and say, hey, what does he mean by this? Now let's make this relevant. That was cool, but let's actually make it relevant. This is a preferred pressure wave. This is the compression stroke here. This is the power stroke here. This is top dead center. This is 14 degrees after top dead center. 14 degrees is not precise right on the money for every engine ever made, but it is the number that most engineers will grasp on to as the best place to have peak cylinder pressure because 14 degrees to 14 degrees the piston really isn't moving so on on the compression stroke you're, you're watching your degree wheel about 14 degrees before top dead center that piston almost comes to a perfect standstill and it doesn't really start moving again until that piston that crank gets about 14 degrees after top dead center at 14 degrees after top dead center the crank starts drawing the piston downward we again have motion now, the benefit of having peak cylinder pressure when that piston is just starting to move can be illustrated as thus. Anybody here shoot bow and arrow, archers? All right, here's the scenario. We're going to take an 80 pound arched bow and an 80 pound compound bow. Give each of them three arrows. We're going to go up to the edge of a field. No target, just shoot them as far as you can. There's the arch bow, phew, three times. Put it down, pick up the compound bow. Three arrows, as far as you can, phew, three times. Which one will shoot further? The compound. the compound bow. But they're both 80 pound bows, so why would a compound bow shoot the arrow any further than an arched bow if they're both 80 pound bows? <laughs> Pushing, pushing the arrow the last More torque. distance Tension. faster. You, know, the, you guys are at least power. starting to visualize what I'm talking about. You can't quite put it into words beautifully and articulately because you haven't had the months to think about it like I have, right? <laughs> Here's my explanation. An arched bow is linear. You're going to let that string go and it's going to take that 80 pounds of thrust and it's going to take old this much string travel to impart that 80 pounds into that arrow. So you're going to take 80 pounds, spread it out over this much string travel. Compound bow has a compound lever action, whatever, and it's going to take that 80 pounds and it's going to deliver it to that arrow and maybe this much string travel. We just concentrated that same 80 pounds of force from this to this. Just like an air compressor, you take so much thermal energy, compress it here, the resultant is higher temperature readings on a thermometer, right? So if we can take 80 pounds of thrust that normally would be delivered to the arrow over this distance and concentrate that force into this distance, we can get more usable work out of that same thrust, right? Okay. If we have an open chamber head, lousy combustion chamber, and it takes forever to burn that fuel, we gotta start our combustion event. We gotta fire the spark plug clear back here at like 38 degrees before top dead center. That means that somewhere around here, we're starting to build pressure. So although we're still shooting for this same number here, we gotta you know, fire the plug clear back here to get anywhere near this. In the meantime, that piston's still coming up, still coming up, and, and, and we're building pressure higher and higher and higher. You follow that? Now, if we have 
an efficient combustion chamber and we're firing it, say, right about here, like 24 degrees before top dead center. Well, the first little bit of time, once that spark ignites, you're just building a little tiny kernel that turns into a pea, that turns into a walnut, and it's not really manifesting elevated pressures. You're just getting the fire going. You know, it's just like you light the match to throw on the bonfire. You're not roasting marshmallows for a while. It takes a while for the paper to catch and then start catching the twist. Okay, now we got a little thermal energy. Same thing here. So at 38 degrees, you got a couple of degrees where nothing's really happening pressure wise, but eventually it catches up and starts surging. Now the crank's trying to push the piston up on the compression stroke and that pressure's trying to push it back down. So we get a much more efficient combustion chamber design, fuel, whatever. We retard the timing. Well, 24 to 14, that's 10 degrees. So that means we're not gonna really be building up a whole heck of a lot of pressure while that piston's still moving up. That gives us 10 degrees of, of free play. And once that piston hits top dead center, you know, it's not pushing back down on the crank, it's just sitting there. Now we got a rock from 14 before to 14 after. Meanwhile, we're combusting more fuel, we're building more pressure, and then we get past the piston starts going down and it just compound both slingshots that piston <clears throat> right down the bore. Do you understand that principle? Big block Chrysler, and I'm a Chrysler fan, by the way. Big block Chrysler, man. That's the old arched bow. Nice, efficient, you know, pent roof 16 valve or squish pad. That's the compound bow. Can we compound it even more? Well, what's the difference between an open chamber and a squish pad, you know, 38 versus 24? I mean, what's the mechanics behind this? how fast we consume the fuel. Mechanically, from a headporter's perspective, an open chamber head, there's no activity going on. That's the dead steel filled that you throw the match into and wait a day for it to burn. There's no activity going on. It takes forever to burn the fuel. Now you throw a squish pad in there and that piston approaches top dead center and it's just like if I were to take this board, stand it up and just push it over, it drops down, you can see the dust clouds over here. Well, that activity is carrying that flame front around to the fuel. It's pushing fuel into that lit flame front. You have activity. You get a much faster burn. That much faster burn allows us to retard the timing, actually make more power. The thing's done burning sooner in the cycle. The pollution's almost non-existent. Because remember I said before lunch that you know I, I poured heads and I'm doing things the hard way and this is the easy way? We're gonna chemically do this. That OH radical throwing the monatomic hydrogen and oxygen in there speeds up the burn. So to take full advantage of it, and we'll get to this in the tuning session, you know, we want to be able to retard the ignition timing some. Because that'll make things even better if we could. And with the optimizer, we can. Even on DIS, coil on plug, I don't care. We're going to retard the ignition timing. See, I told you we were covering stuff in this class that you missed in the last one because I didn't get there. <clears throat> so, speeding up the burn. Monatomic hydrogen, monatomic oxygen speeds up the burn. With this big block Chrysler, we start firing it here. The exhaust valve opens and it's still burning clear back at the tailpipe. You get a good, efficient burn. You retard the timing because you don't need as much lead time to get your VMEP. And then it's done burning and you slingshotted that piston down the board just like with the compound bow. It's done burning. The pollution, eh, there ain't none. It's all been consumed and it's, you've turned more, remember combustion efficiency, we've turned more of that chemical energy into thermal energy okay. and a part of the cycle where we can actually harness it and turn it into kinetic energy. Starting to, you know, take bits and pieces and start putting them together into a little bit bigger puzzle here, now, aren't we? You guys get that? Do you understand that? The, the slope you have for your, your pressure. Mm-hmm. With the advanced timing, your back slope's going to be much steeper, isn't it? Or is it still yeah, I'm just freehanding this. But I mean, it, it should yeah, you know, you're 38. Your 38 degree lead time, you're actually gonna, you know, build up like this. And then it's gonna, you know, kinda go like this, or something like that. 
Now you're asking for a nice slope. Let me try again here. And then uh, let me do this and again. Let's do it in brown. No, I still screwed it up. This, this, this peak is supposed to be over here. But, but, but the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, you'll have a spike and then it'll have a rapid drop off. Whereas the other way, you don't have quite as high peak pressures. Your peak pressures will actually be a little bit lower. But instead of dropping off, they'll actually maintain higher because right about um, here, is your 90 degrees. 90 degrees, right angle, okay? Crankshaft, piston, right angle. If you're pulling on a torque wrench, is it easier to get it to click this way or this way? Or this way, this way. So that'd be the 90 degree crank angle. Well, this is where you have your maximum mechanical leverage on the crankshaft. By building peak pressure here, you're getting that compound bow sling slot, slingshot effect, but the piston picks up speed as it goes down, which is what accounts for that rapid drop in pressure because we're expanding the volume in there. The, the, the same pressure, larger volume, lower pressure. But if we can get a, a fast burn and we can maintain a higher pressure later here, then we get more mechanical push on that piston at that 90 degree crank angle. It's actually 90 degree crank to connecting rod angle, which is probably you know, like 85, 83 degrees or something, I mean, if you want to get technical. And so if we can delay the spark timing, we can still build peak pressure at 14 degrees after top dead center and actually maintain a little bit higher pressure further down the bore, get to that 90 degree mark and still be pushing on that piston instead of, you know, kind of tuckering out. Same gasoline, same, we just made more power with it. So if you got the big block Chrysler and you're just cruising down the highway, it's going to take more throttle opening because of how much of that energy you're able to turn into kinetic than it will a little, you know, four-cylinder Honda that's able to delay the spark event, maximize the pressure where it's supposed to, and hold on to it a little bit longer. And that's where we're getting our efficiency. That's where you get in your efficiency. This is the goal to tune the engines. This will be the goal to... Well, yeah, if you understand this aspect of it, when we start looking at altering the ignition timing, mm -hmm. this is the we start looking at leaning out the air fuel charge. And you understand this, I'm hoping that you'll better understand the tuning process and you'll maximize the hardware better because you know what it's supposed to be doing and you know which direction to go instead of I turn the knob and I can't tell the difference. Grasp this one. Is this getting exciting or am I putting you to sleep?